And um, I'm more than happy to take questions about glaucoma or other eye-related issues at the end of this. All right. <clears throat> so first of all, let's talk about what glaucoma is. Um, and then I'll also kind of touch on what some other important eye diseases are and how they can be related to, to glaucoma, or some of the symptoms <clears throat> that we experience um, when we have glaucoma. Glaucoma is a chronic disease, so it is something that we live with. There is not a cure just yet. Um, and there are ways that we try to stabilize the condition and manage it over many years. But again, it is a chronic condition. It can be progressive. Um, and the damage that occurs is to the optic nerve. Um, and the damage of the optic nerve can subsequently lead to vision loss that is irreversible. So unlike some other conditions, such as a cataract, um, which is a reversible a source of vision loss, where we do a cataract surgery and then we immediately improve your vision, glaucoma causes loss of vision that cannot um, be regained. And that really underscores the importance of early detection, screening, and treatment. I'll discuss what the risk factors are in a moment, but I do want to mention that the only known modifiable risk factor at this time is controlling the eye pressure. Three million Americans have glaucoma, and it is the second leading cause of blindness worldwide. There are racial disparities, and it's very important to know those. Glaucoma disproportionately affects those of African descent and also Latin descent. The rates of blindness in those of African descent and Latin descent are much higher than in other populations. There are two main types of glaucoma, open angle glaucoma, and that's the one that, again, disproportionately affects those of African and Latin descent. There is another major type of glaucoma called angle closure glaucoma, and that disproportionately affects those of East Asian descent. And I'll talk about reasons why and the anatomy uh, as I go further. As we get older, the, the risk of us getting glaucoma also increases. Another very important risk factor is family history. And I became interested in this disease and in becoming an eye doctor when I was very young. In this photograph, you see six women. They are all sisters. The one who was sitting down with the uh, white scarf on her head and a plaid scarf is my, my father's mother, my grandmother. And between these six sisters, four of them went on to have glaucoma. And the two others that did not have glaucoma passed it on to their children. So there's a very strong family history component here. And this is uh, me and my father. He has glaucoma. Um, I have been listening to him, hearing him, helping him with his eye exams for many, many years, well before I was even in medical school. Those who have a family history do get glaucoma at a younger age. They are actually at a threefold increased risk of developing glaucoma. So if you have a relative that has glaucoma, a first degree or even a second degree relative, I do recommend getting an eye exam. We know that the risk is especially high among siblings. So as I showed you the picture of my grandmothers, four out of six had glaucoma. The, the, the risk of this is again, very high, even higher than in a, a, a relationship between a parent and a child. Also, if someone has in their family history, uh, anyone who's had glaucoma as a child or before the age of 35, there is again, a very strong uh, a link there. And so I do encourage getting an eye exam for those of you who have some of these risk factors, at least by the age of 40, if not sooner. The consequences on vision, there's kind of some confusion about what glaucoma actually does to the eyes. It doesn't truly cause blindness in most people. Most people actually just experience difficulties with their activities of daily living due to some things that may seem small and inconsequential, but really impact us on a daily basis. So one of those is our contrast sensitivity. This is something that is usually not checked by eye doctors, um, but is very important to glaucoma. So you can see in this chart, that there are letters and they are of different contrasts. And as we go down the chart, they become lighter and then the ones at the top are darker. What glaucoma can do is that it becomes harder to see those lighter colored letters. And um, we need to, uh, to have higher contrast. So darker print, those who have contrast sensitivity loss also need more lighting to see just everything in general. 
Now, all of us lose some contrast as we age. That is why, um, you know, we see folks who are maybe in the 70s, 80s, having a harder time driving at night, even though they have quote unquote healthy eyes. That is because all of us lose some contrast and need more light as we age. This is the normal part of aging. But if you're someone who has glaucoma or another eye condition, this can actually happen faster. Other things that can happen are the loss of your visual field. So this is where maybe you develop tunnel vision, things on the sides of your eyes become harder to detect. There are also blind spots all over the place. They can be splotches here and there. They are very annoying. When you're trying to read or watch something or look at someone's face, you just kind of see a splotch or a blurred patch in part of it. And you try to clean it off or think maybe you should just put some drops in but actually that's the vision loss that can occur with glaucoma. And then when the disease is very advanced, then it does start to impact the visual acuity and visual acuity is what eye doctors check when you go to see them. They ask you to read um, letters on a chart or numbers on a chart. What we're actually measuring is visual acuity. So when someone tells you that your vision is 20-20, um, that's what they're, uh, the number that they're quoting to you. Other problems that can happen are glare and light sensitivity. So glare, glare is um, when you're out, uh, a lot of people notice it at night when they're driving and they see um, the headlights from another car coming at them and it's, it's really blinding. They have to stop on the side of the road or they need some type of uh, tinted lens or something to prevent that glare. Or in the daytime when we're driving and um, the sun is bothering us, it, it really can cause like this disabling glare and the same type of symptoms occur. So it's not just that we lose our visual acuity and it becomes harder to see in the dark, but problems with glare are, are really quite pronounced in those with the glaucoma. And all of these things may not necessarily decrease your visual acuity. You might still have 20-20 vision when you go to see the eye doctor, but there are just these annoying components of our vision that um, that get lost, like you know the the glare and then the difficulty seeing in um, more darkly lit conditions. And this is really becoming a problem because if you go to restaurants these days, you probably notice that they turn the lights down very low and they just have a small little candle on the table, and you're supposed to read your menu with that small little light. This is an example of a visual field test. The ways that we monitor visual fields are simply by having someone look straight at, at a target. We tell them to keep looking straight at that target and then we project um, stimuli on the sides of their eye. We go from a non-seeing part of the vision to a seeing part and ask them when they can actually see our stimulus. So the point at which they can see the stimulus is, is the seeing part of their eye and the part where they cannot see our stimulus is the non-seeing part. We can try to do it with different objects or our, our fingers in the office, but the most uh, accurate way to do, to do this is with a test that we have in the eye doctor's office. It's called a visual field test. And this is where we can get an automated um, idea of where your uh, vision loss is or where your, your blurred patches are. And so the image that's all the way on the left is a normal eye. We all have a blind spot. So that little, that, um, that dark patch that you see there is normal. And that uh, blind spot refers to where the artery and the vein of your eye cross. There is, is not any uh, uh, nerve tissue per se in that spot, it gets moved to the side. Um, but what becomes a problem is when we develop dark patches elsewhere in our periphery. So this is, a, this is an example of someone who developed vision loss, or sorry, visual field loss over time. Um, and you can kind of see how it impacted their vision. These hash marks represent the center so this person started off in a normal way, and then eventually they started developing some vision loss in the center, and then down below, a little bit by their nose, and then over the years it grew until they had a really dark patch in the center of their vision and um, down below. So I, I can imagine that this person probably has a harder time taking step or seeing things um, down below, um, and then also has a harder time reading or seeing faces. Here's also an example of how vision can be lost over time. And again, I want you to try to disassociate the word vision with visual acuity. There's a lot of components of our vision. We need our peripheral vision. We need our ability to see in um, dimly lit conditions or the contrast. Um, we need to not have glare. 
um, and also to have good visual acuity in order to have good quote unquote vision. So here's an example of someone who the butterfly details are still pretty sharp as the disease progresses, but you can see that it becomes tunnelized over time. And there's a lot of uh, dark patches on the sides of the eye and even the center of the butterfly becomes kind of dull. Here's another example of what may occur to someone. It probably wouldn't be quite this drastic, but again, it's the tunnel vision and then some blurred patches. And these blurred patches are really important. This, this person here is driving. What if this blurred patch is over a green light or a red light or important street signs? Glaucoma can really impact us in many different ways. The ability to read become, can become more difficult, being able to feel safe with mobility and walking, fear of falling. Driving can become more challenging, even in-home activities like cooking, uh, social interactions, so being able to feel comfortable going out of the house um, and engaging in, uh, in, in social interactions with others. Um, maybe uh, something as simple as when someone reaches their hand out to shake your hand to be, to be able to see that accurately and to meet their hand. Some people who have vision loss, um, especially glaucoma, struggle with some of those because they, they feel they lose their confidence when they can't see quite as well. And then how does it make us feel to have a chronic condition and, and to have vision loss? It can really impact a person in a very dramatic way. I have seen this not only as a physician, but really in a very personal way um, in my own family. Um, and there are uh, there's increase in anxiety, depression, um, and and these things can make other medical conditions worse, or just really impact how a person feels about themselves. I do want to talk about how we diagnose glaucoma. In order to complete to do a complete eye exam, I do recommend getting one's eyes dilated. So traditionally, when we go to see the eye doctor, we get our, our visual acuity checked. I would always recommend to get an eye pressure check. And then one of the other tests, if you're someone who's at risk for glaucoma and wants to get the glaucoma screening, is to get a visual field checked. And the visual field, I, I just went over that where I showed you the picture of um, kind of the almond shape and the, where the blurred patches were and how they grew over time. Um, so here is an example of someone taking the visual field test. Um, they basically put their head in a in a box is what I would call it. And that inside that box or that bowl, there is a light stimulus and a, a target. And we instruct everyone to look at that target. We give them something to hold in their hand. And we say, every time you see a flicker on the side of your eye, click this. And um, so that's how we measure the visual field. Other things that we do are look at the optic nerve because as I mentioned, glaucoma is caused by damage to the optic nerve and we get photographs or scans. Here's an example of someone getting an eye pressure check. There are several ways to check the eye pressure these days. There are handheld machines, there are air puffs, and then there's the blue light. The air puff is not a good way to get the pressure check. If you go somewhere and they only have the air puff, then go somewhere else. Um, if, uh, if you go to a place that only has a handheld machine, that might be okay, but really the best way to get your pressure check is with the blue light test. This is pretty standard in, uh, I mean, almost every eye practice, definitely every ophthalmologist should be using the blue light test. Um, and if they're not, then you should request this. And this can be done again at an ophthalmologist's office or an optometrist's office. And then this is how we look at the optic nerve. Again, it's just a contraption that looks, um, uh, you know, where you basically put your head into a, a, a chin rest and a head rest. And we have you look at a blue cross or some type of a target. And then we take a photograph of your optic nerve. And believe it or not, these are images of the back of someone's eye. And we're measuring the thickness of the nerve tissue. If the nerve tissue is declining over time, it's an indication that glaucoma is progressing or that glaucoma is occurring. And um, these tests, the visual field and the optic nerve photograph are things that we want to do at least once a year if for a person who's suspicious for glaucoma and also when we're diagnosing glaucoma. Eye pressure should be checked at every visit. And whether you go to an eye doctor once a year or once every six months, they should always check your eye pressure. There are many different treatments for glaucoma. We usually start off with medications and then we move on to lasers and surgeries. 
Um, in terms of the medical therapies, there's lots of different uh, lots of different options here. We have something called a beta blocker. Beta blockers are the same things that we use to treat high blood pressure. I do want to mention that high blood pressure and high eye pressure are very different. Um, having a high blood pressure doesn't mean that you're going to have a high eye pressure. And having a high eye pressure doesn't mean you're going to have a high blood pressure either. Um, but it's interesting that beta blockers are used to treat both conditions. Another medication that is extremely popular are called prostaglandin analog eye drops. These eye drops are really popular because they lower the eye pressure the most. And they also are just used once a day, generally in the evening. There's another uh, class of medications called carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And these have been around for a very long time. How they work is by reducing the production of the fluid inside the eye. Um, and another group of medications are the alpha agonists. These medications also decrease the production of um, the fluid inside the eye. And uh, a fourth class of medications are called rho kinase inhibitors. These are newer medications and um, they work by several mechanisms, but um, generally the, the, the target of all of these medications is to lower the eye pressure. Now, these days we actually have an injectable medication. So there are some people who say that I just don't like to use eye drops. I'm having side effects of eye drops. Um, I forget to use them, whatever it may be. And we can actually do one of these eye injections there are eye injections of a medication and they're done commonly for conditions like macular degeneration and those who have diabetic eye disease and some other things. Um, and so I, I really feel like glaucoma is kind of the last eye condition to, to jump on to this uh, injectable medication treatment, but we do have it now. Um, so that is something that you may wanna ask your doctor about if you're interested. Um, the injectable medications only last for a certain period of time and they do need to be repeated. Um, we're also coming up with contact lenses or some type of a implant that you wear on your eye that can be taken out that has um, some type of drug eluding component to it. So you can put this contact lens on and it slowly releases the medication in your eyes. We also have injectable, or sorry, not injectable, but um, implantable versions of these contact lenses. It would involve a surgery where we're implanting a little type of device um, and uh, that uh, needs to be refilled later on, but we put the medication in that little delivery uh, device. Um, we're actually doing studies on some of the, these things here at Hopkins, um, but there is one product at least that is available currently called Durista. And here's an image of a patient actually getting one of these eye injections. Um, so what we do, obviously we numb the eye. Uh, we do this here in the clinic, everything is very sterile. And we take the device that has the, um, the medication uh, implanted in it. And uh, we go ahead and just insert it into the eye at the microscope. It's not a true surgery. It's usually done in the office, sometimes in a minor procedures room. And some doctors just feel more comfortable doing it in the operating room. So it can be done in any of those places. We always do these where it's safe to do it. And then laser treatment is a great option. I personally am a big fan of the laser treatments for glaucoma because they're done in the office. Um, they don't involve much time, probably five minutes or less. They are very low risk. They can be repeated if needed and they don't preclude the ability to have other treatments like medications or surgeries. And basically what happens is that we put a lens or like a contact lens on the front of a person's eye and then we shine light for about two to five minutes and that cleans the drainage canal of the eye. And by cleaning the drainage canal of the eye, we're lowering the eye pressure. Then we move on to traditional glaucoma surgeries. And with traditional glaucoma surgeries, again, remember that um, we're trying to control the eye pressure and some people's drainage canal is so plugged up or so damaged that even with medications and lasers, we cannot seem to make it work any better. And at that point, we recommend different types of surgeries where we actually implant a, a shunt into the eye or create another drainage system. So this is an example of creating another drainage system. This is called a trabeculectomy operation. We actually dissect and create like this little flap in the front of the eye. And this cartoon just is like a image that is used um, for, for training doctors. But how it actually looks in clinic um, after the surgery is done is like this image here on the right. There's a small little bump on the top of the eye. It indicates that the fluid is 
it's actually flowing to that little bump and the bump is covered by the eyelid. So in this image, we've actually raised the person's eyelid. It's not that the, the bump just permanently um, is showing up like that. And here's an aqueous tube shunt. This is where we implant a silicone tube shunt into the front chamber of the eye. So a device is left behind, whereas with this trabeculectomy, no devices are left behind. We're just creating this flap and then putting stitches down. And in this one, uh, we're leaving a device behind. I think both surgeries are very good. Which one a person should have is really dependent on the type of glaucoma they have, how many medications they're on, what their target eye pressure is, um, maybe if they've had other eye surgeries, what their risks are for these particular surgeries. And then there is another a class of surgeries called the minimally invasive uh, procedures. And with minimally invasive procedures, the downtime is less than with the surgeries I just mentioned. Um, and they they are, are called minimally invasive because we just we do them through a very small incision in the front of the eye. The incision about this is about the same size as, as the size of the incision for a cataract procedure. So it's just a few millimeters, usually about two millimeters or maybe three at most. And we're implanting um, either a shunt in the eye into the, into the drainage system. Um, and these images here show us implanting, this is a titanium device. And this is a stent that goes into the drainage system. Um, there's another type where we don't leave anything behind in the eye. We simply take a blade and open the canal. So I mentioned the laser earlier, the laser shines light on the canal. There's another surgery where we can actually take a little blade and open the canal with a knife. And that's what this first image here on the left shows. And then this last image here shows something called a Zen surgery, X-E-N, Zen. Um, and that is where we implant this tiny, almost like a, I call it a vermicelli noodle. It's just a tiny little shunt as opposed to this bigger shunt. Um, and a, a device is left behind in the eye and a, a person does develop a bleb like shown here in this picture, but the bleb is generally smaller and the recovery is faster for these minimally invasive procedures. So if a person has a very busy lifestyle, um, you know, can't take a lot of time off work, uh, maybe their glaucoma is not that severe, I, I generally recommend the minimally invasive procedures. But if you're someone who has more advanced disease, has a really high pressure and really needs to come down a lot, um, very sensitive to medications, um, and, and then I would recommend the traditional surgeries. It's kind of a risk reward. You may have less risk in your surgery, but the reward is less. And that's very true of the minimally invasive procedures. I think that there are very good surgeries, but um, the, the risk is, is very minimal. Um, and the uh, reward is generally good, but with the traditional glaucoma surgeries like trabeculectomy and tube shunt, those do usually lower the eye pressure more, but the risk is greater, definitely, those procedures. There are uh, finer surgeries, um, uh, greater surgical technique is required to do those and there are more stitches uh, in the eye. And, you know, I did mention, um, well, what really causes glaucoma? We are trying to figure out all of the causes. We don't know what they are, but, but the only known modifiable risk factor that we are aware of at this time is a high eye pressure. And because we know that, our treatments are really focused on lowering the eye pressure. But we think that there are other things that also damage the opt optic nerve, like oxidative stress. You probably have heard a lot about oxidative stress causing conditions like dementia or other neurologic conditions um, and how these oxidative species in our body can damage other parts of our body. Um, so what, what uh, a potential mechanism of action is to try to reduce the oxidative stress in one's body. And also we think that there may be blood flow abnormalities that lead to glaucoma and not just cause glaucoma, but for people who, especially who have a normal eye pressure, we see that some folks are still progressing or losing more vision, even though they have a quote unquote normal eye pressure. And we think that maybe they have some blood flow abnormality issues. So for example, when you get your blood pressure checked, there's a top number and a bottom number. The top number is called systolic and the bottom number is called diastolic. If you are someone whose diastolic blood pressure fluctuates a lot, or if you're someone who has a normal eye no, sorry, normal blood pressure in the daytime, but at night your blood pressure drops a lot, or something happens where you have a normal pressure and then it just drops and fluctuates a lot, 
then you are definitely prone to glauco getting glaucoma and not just getting glaucoma, but if you have it, having a progression of that disease. The reason why we um, I think that these two other factors, oxidative stress and blood flow issues are important are again, because we have people who have a quote unquote normal eye pressure who come and see us in the office, but we are still diagnosing them with glaucoma and some of them are still progressing. And if you're someone who's progressing in spite of having a normal pressure, we should be doing an investigation of some of these other issues. So I will send patients to get their blood pressure checked, uh, perhaps to get something called a Holter monitor where they wear something for about a week, um, including at night that monitors their blood pressure and their heart rate. In terms of oxidative stress, um, the best way to try to control that is really with your diet. These days, we think that popping a pill is the way to do everything, but it is not true. The best way to get vitamins is in our food because vitamins have coatings and capsules and diet is just food. That is just straight up raw and organic. Um, if you can increase your consumption of antioxidants, so those are things with carotenoids and flavonoids, for example, fruits, green leafy vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, like cauliflower, root vegetables. And there has actually been some evidence for drinking hot caffeinated tea. It does not have to do with caffeine, but it has to do with um, tea, an acid that is in tea. Um, and we think that these are things that have some antioxidative properties and should be incorporated in your diet to prevent damage to your nerves or to prevent progression of damage. Other things that are really good in your diet are omega-3 fatty acids. These are typically found in fish, fish oil, walnuts, and flaxseed. Omega-3 fatty acid rich diet is excellent, not only for preventing this oxidative stress in our body, but also has been linked to um, reduced rates of macular degeneration. So those people who are at risk for macular degeneration or who have macular degeneration, I highly, highly recommend consuming the Mediterranean diet. In the Mediterranean diet, if you're not Mediterranean already, you can simply look this up online, but I will tell you that it incorporates a lot of these things that I've already mentioned, green leafy vegetables, fish, um, and nuts. Generally, it's best to avoid a heavy caffeine intake, especially on the day when you're going to get an eye exam because having very, very uh, like uh, four cups of coffee a day, or more um, can actually cause an increase in your eye pressure. Lifestyle is very important. These are all things that you can do to try to prevent disease in your life. Aerobic exercise of 30 to 45 minutes per day is very important. Please do this three to four times per week for your whole life. We have to make time for ourselves. Try to avoid any exhaustive exercise like activities with breath holding, when we hold our breath, we're actually increasing the pressure in our head and to our eyes. There have been studies that have shown that the more steps you, you take, um, the slower your loss of visual field. So for someone who has glaucoma, um, you, you might wanna encourage uh, either the person in your life who has glaucoma or yourself <laughs> to take more steps. People who are more active, their disease progresses less. Meditation is important and meditation involves lots of different components, but generally it means just relaxing and taking some deep breaths, normal breaths, not breath holding activities, but normal breathing. There's something called pranayama breathing exercises. It's part of yoga. Um, uh, alternate nostril breathing, maybe some of you have heard of that, but these are breathing exercises that help to regulate our blood flow. I do recommend avoiding prolonged head down positions. I'm a very big fan of yoga myself, um, but if you have glaucoma or at risk, you don't really want your head to be below your heart for more than a minute or two, because again, you're putting pressure on your head and potentially on your eye. It's very important to create a partnership with your doctors. Um, you know, ask questions, also do your own homework, these days, medicine has, has become, it's changed. Um, you know, doctors are being required to see more and more patients, to do more paperwork and uh, click things on the computer. And as a result, we don't get to spend as much time with our patients. And that's really what we got into medicine for was to help people and to talk to people, not to look at a computer. 
Um, so sometimes you will find yourself needing to, uh, you know, be your own advocate, look things up yourself, but definitely you want to have a partnership with your doctor because this is someone who you are going to have a relationship with for your lifetime, hopefully um, someone who will always be there to provide care for you and who knows your eyes well. There are things that you can do for yourself to improve your functional vision. These are things that we do at home uh, for my family members who have glaucoma. We try to make things brighter. So we've changed light bulbs in our house. Um, also uh, just kind of changed uh, the, the, the um, contrast sensitivity on our phones and on our tablets. So we're trying to maximize contrast um, and maximizing contrast could I mean for you uh, using more color in your in your dress or in your home. An example is a lot of us have these beautiful white floors and white walls. Um, you know, the floor, a person could fall on the floor if they can't see, especially in the bathroom. So in our bathroom, we have we do have white tiles, but we have put very colorful rugs. So we have um, like green rugs in our bathroom. Um, at, the places where uh, a person would stand or come out of the shower. And as a result, um, that we have high contrast in our bathroom so people can see the difference between the white and the, the colored carpet so they know where to step. Um, also consider using audio. Technology has actually been very good in this way. Everything talks to us now. Our phones talk to us, our computers talk to us. Um, we can get GPS directions that talk to us. You can talk into your phone instead of having to type it will type for you text to speech and just generally try to keep things organized and minimize clutter in your life. It will reduce your risk of falling. Falling is bad. Falling um, can lead to a lot of awful things. It's better just to take your time, keep things simple and clean in your home. Also trying to minimize glare is a good idea. Um, glare can mean uh, uh, doing things like using visors, baseball hats, also, I do recommend different types of tinted glasses. These are glasses that you can wear over your contact lenses or over your normal daily glasses. Plum tint, amber tint, um, and also yellow tint are good. They can help you to minimize glare quite a bit. And you can buy these online or even at just hardware stores. Here are examples of some of the things that I mentioned. So make things bigger for yourself. There is no point in struggling reading 12 font in your favorite book. It's very frustrating. Your eyes start to hurt. You get upset. Why can't I read this? Don't do that to yourself. Use something that magnifies the words for you. You can use an e-reader that actually you just kind of carry over your book. Um, or I, personally, one thing I love is a handheld lighted magnifier, which you can get online also. Um, Amazon is a great place to find things. Um, but these are magnifiers that you hold and they have a light and you can adjust the lighting to three different or four different settings. There's like a warm light, um, uh, like a like a, a bluish light. You know, there's different settings and you can find the one that works best for you and you can magnify things. This here is an image of someone just wearing some tinted glasses to reduce glare. And this is the idea that I had mentioned of just using high contrast in your home so that people aren't falling. This is a gooseneck lamp, which can be put on a desk. It can be put on, um, you know, on your uh, bed stand and you can just adjust the lamp so that it is to the height that you want it to be. There are a lot of great resources. Um, they mostly in, require you to use the internet um, and uh, also potentially your phone. So I do want to say that I'm the, one of the, um, the founders and hosts of the Diagnosis Glaucoma podcast. The way to find our podcast is um, you can go to our website, diagnosisglaucoma.com. You can type us into Google, Diagnosis Glaucoma podcast. Um, you can find us on YouTube and on your favorite podcast player if you listen to podcasts. But again, YouTube is, I, th I think, a great way to find us. Um, my a colleague and I, Dr. Harry Quigley, we talk about pretty much every topic related to glaucoma. We talk about some other conditions like cataract, dry eye. And uh, we have now uh, had our podcast since um, 2020. So four years later, we're still going strong with lots of different topics and ideas. And we have invited guest speakers from all over the country. Um, another great resource is the Glaucoma Research Foundation website. 
This is one of my favorite resources. It is great for patients. It is oriented towards patients and they actually have a patient conference every year. I just came back from their conference in Philadelphia in June. It was excellent. And their next conference will be in June of 2025 in Dallas, Texas. I'm one of the authors of a book called Glaucoma, What Every Patient Should Know. I wrote this with, again, Dr. Harry Quickly, my colleague at Johns Hopkins. Uh, this book is not only in print, on, you can find it on Amazon if you want to buy it, but you can simply just Google it. Um, you can find the book for free on the Diagnosis Glaucoma website. Um, you can also listen to it if you can't read it. We have an audio book and you can find the links for the audio book on the Diagnosis Glaucoma podcast website. Another great book that I like is called Glaucoma, What You Need to Know to Preserve and Enhance Your Health. Um, this is written by one of our colleagues in Philadelphia, Dr. George Spaeth. It's a really nice, concise book. Uh, he's a great writer. Um, there is the World Glaucoma Association website. Excellent. You don't have to be, um, uh, I mean, it's for everyone from all over the world. They have a patient section. Um, and then also the American Glaucoma Society website has a section for patients with handouts and other information. And there's another website called hadley.edu. And this has been created by people who have uh, either are visually impaired or those who take care of those who are visually impaired. And it's really uh, a good resource in terms of figuring out how to improve your functionality with vision loss. So some take home points for today are that glaucoma can be controlled. Most people don't go blind, but there is a partnership over one's lifetime. The treatment um, does go on. You should continue to be monitored once, twice, maybe sometimes more than that in a year. I'd highly recommend a routine exam for you or for your close blood relatives at least once a year, maybe twice. And um, it's really important to try to maximize your functionality, to try to focus on what you can do instead of what you can't do, um, and to really be creative. This is your opportunity to uh, to think outside of the box. One thing that my, my mother did at home, which I thought was very creative, and this is a long time ago before I, I again, was even an eye doctor, is she put um, yellow paint. So, um, you know, going in and out of the garage, there's a big pole in the middle of the garage, and that's not that easy for my dad to see. Um, because of his glaucoma and his peripheral uh, issues. So she actually um, put like very high contrast yellow and blue paint in areas in the garage so that he could see it. And, um, it, you know, it made it more comfortable for him to just go in and out of the garage. There are a lot of different treatment options. There's a wide variety from medications, um, surgeries, laser treatments. And then also I mentioned some of the things you can do it in, ter in terms of your diet and lifestyle. Right now, the, the main treatment is through lowering the eye pressure, but we are working on other mechanisms of treatment. And it's very important to be an advocate for yourself and your loved ones. As a physician, I, I know I mentioned this earlier, um, we are really being squeezed very hard by the system to see more and more patients, to spend less time with the patient and to do more work um, on a computer doing something called compliance. Um, but if you can really reach out to your physician, um, maybe go into the exam with questions, uh, having read some information, that way your uh, visit with the doctor is more targeted. You can really get the most um, information, even if it's a short visit. But be an advocate for yourself. Um, again, use some of the resources I mentioned, and this impacts not only you, but also your loved ones. What is the future of glaucoma in the United States? Well, um, we're actually working on telemedicine and at-home testing modalities so that may maybe people don't have to come in quite as much to the office and we can do some of the testing from home. Um, there are studies on shared decision-making between patients and providers. I am doing that work at Hopkins. I'm working on some patient-centered uh, resources uh, to try to make the uh, patient experience better, more efficient, and more targeted towards um, a patient's real needs. We are working on these sustained release medications that are implanted into the eye. We are doing studies on that at Johns Hopkins. Also, um, the minimally invasive procedures are uh, another area where um, uh, we see a future in the care of glaucoma. 
Um, and again, work that we're doing at Hopkins studies on different types of uh, minimally invasive procedures. Stem cell therapy and neuroprotection is a big area. I get asked about this several times a day. I do wanna say that I have a colleague, um, Dr. Tom Johnson, he's working on this, but it is very, very far um, from occurring. Right now he's doing the work in basically animal models. We are not doing stem cell therapy in humans. We are not injecting anything. Um, we think that when this occurs, well, we, we don't exactly when it's gonna occur. Um, hopefully in, in, in my lifetime, I'll get a chance to see it in action. Um, but what we think is going to happen is that this will be a surgery that involves implanting the stem cells. Um, and those were the comments that I had for today. I have listed my email address here at the bottom for anyone who would like to contact me. Um, I do want to mention that I get about 70 emails a day. So if I don't respond to you right away, I have not ignored you or forgotten about you. I will eventually get to you. Um, and um, another great resource is the website that I have listed here. It's diagnosisglaucoma.com. This is where you can find all of our podcasts, our book, uh, either in print or the audio book, and some other great links to go to. Um, I think I had it on my previous slide, but um, but I am involved in uh, uh, quite a few studies and trials at Hopkins. Um, either directly or um, with my colleagues and the name of our my development officer is here. You can contact Daniela Freed and I do have her email here if you're interested in being part of one of my studies or a study that one of my colleagues is in or if you want to support us in any way. Um, we, we really do appreciate your support. Um, and lastly, I should tell you all that I, I do practice out of the office in Bethesda, Maryland. I also practice at um, uh, the Wilmer Johns Hopkins office in Columbia, Maryland with Howard County General Hospital. Um, there are eight of us in the division of glaucoma at the Wilmer Eye Institute. We are located all over, not just in Baltimore. So you don't necessarily have to go to Baltimore to be seen. Although I am the, the only glaucoma specialist in um, Bethesda um, and I, uh, but um, I'm more than happy to see you and provide care in either the Bethesda or Columbia offices or to refer you to one of my really excellent colleagues. And at this point, I will go ahead and take questions. Thank you, Dr. Colleen, for that very informative presentation. We will now open the Q&A session to address questions from today's attendees. So our first question from the audience is, please talk pseudo-exfoliation syndrome in relationship to getting glaucoma. Pseudo-exfoliation syndrome is one of the risk factors for glaucoma. Uh, so basically pseudo-exfoliation, those are like little protein deposits. They can occur all over our body. Um, but one of the places where they can deposit is in the eye itself. And when they deposit in the eye, they land into the drainage system and can block it, or um, it just makes it harder for the, the drainage to work in the eye. And that's how a person can develop glaucoma from pseudoexfoliation. But the treatments are generally the same, medications, laser surgery, but anyone who has pseudoexfoliation is considered um, uh, a glaucoma suspect and should be seen at least once a year. Thank you, doctor. Our next question from the audience is what can be done to prevent glaucoma? What about using blue light glasses for viewing computer phone screens? Is the use of sunglasses helpful for prevent for prevention purposes? Blue light glasses will not help anyone uh, prevent glaucoma. They can potentially decrease some strain, but there's a lot of controversy around the use of blue light glasses. They won't harm you, but if they're really helpful or not, I don't know. One thing I will say is that we spend a lot of time on screens that we shouldn't be doing, that we weren't doing. Um, I, I mean, in my lifetime, when I was younger, I, I never used any screens. Um, and that's really causing a lot of strain and dry eyes. Uh, a very, very common issue is getting dry eyes from just excessive staring and, and um, looking at screens. So I would recommend if you're someone who uses a lot of screens to use artificial tears. I personally like one called Refresh, which can be purchased over the counter at any pharmacy. Um, in terms of uh, just wearing sunglasses in general, 
UVA and UVB protection is critical. Otherwise, you're wasting your time wearing sunglasses. And that is a good way to try to prevent cataract. Um, the sun damages many things in our body, including our eyes. It can cause cataract. And it can also, um, for those who are at risk for macular degeneration, uh, make that worse. So I, I, I do recommend avoiding um, the sunlight to your eyes directly as much as possible. Thank you, Dr. Colleen. Our next question from your audience is, when do you administer a visual field test? Do you control where the light flashes occur or is there an automated program that you run? The visual field test is done in two ways. So the traditional way or the, you know, the, the poor man's way is where we just have a person look at a target and then we take our hand and we kind of move it and we ask them when they can actually see um, when they can see our hand. So that's one way to check it. That's something that I do when I, if I am visiting someone who um, can't uh, go to an eye clinic, I, I check their peripheral vision that way. Um, there are a lot of different reasons why someone could lose their peripheral vision besides glaucoma. It could also be from, I mean, there's a host of things, but they, but they generally involve the optic nerve. So they're generally considered more serious conditions. Um, and so the machine that we use to check this, uh, the best way to check it, in my opinion, is with an automated test. And it was that box. Um, I showed the image of that earlier where you're kind of looking into a box and you, you get handed like a, a clicker and you click on it every time you see a flicker in the side of your eye. That test should be done once a year for those who are at, who are at risk for glaucoma and for those who have glaucoma. It is the only way that we have of actually um, monitoring uh, the vision changes that occur over time in a way where we can pick up or detect a change uh, very quickly because the changes that occur in the visual field, we generally pick them up before the visual acuity loss occurs. Thank you, Dr. Quinn. Our next question, do eye specialists do surgery or any ophthalmologist? That's a good question. Um, now, um, uh, ophthalmologists are MDs or DOs, and um, uh, we do surgeries. Optometrists are partners in eye care, and um, they don't do surgery, but they're very important in um, comprehensive eye examinations, in, in detecting disease, and then uh, um, referring patients as needed for surgeries and treatments. And the person that you want to see if you are at risk for glaucoma, um, uh, is, or if you have glaucoma, is an ophthalmologist. And I, I generally recommend um, to try to see a glaucoma specialist if possible. If you're trying to find one, you can look on the American Glaucoma Society website. There is a place where you can type in your zip code and it can tell you who the American Glaucoma Society uh, glaucoma specialists are. This is a society of almost all of the glaucoma specialists in the country. Um, these are people who have continued uh, uh, we finish a, a ophthalmology residency, which is four years, and then those who do a glaucoma actually do an extra year of training uh, or called fellowship. And for one year, we only focus on glaucoma, doing glaucoma surgery, glaucoma testing, research in glaucoma, everything, glaucoma, glaucoma, glaucoma. So we're really the experts. Not everyone who's done a fellowship um, becomes a member of the society, uh, but you generally wanna find someone who's done a fellowship and, um, uh, you know, again, in terms of like a screening exam, I think that an optometrist or a comprehensive ophthalmologist is just fine um, uh, and good. But if you really need some type of a treatment, then I, I would reach out to a glaucoma specialist. Thank you. Does Lactona Prost darken and deepen the iron tissue under and above the eye? There are a class of medications I mentioned called prostaglandin analogs, and latanoprost is one of those medications. Those are the eye drops that are just used once a day in the evenings, and they do lower the pressure the most, but some of the side effects are making the eyelashes get longer. Um, and uh, sometimes um, they can uh, cause some uh, atrophy of the fat around our eyes and then cause kind of the sunken in appearance. It's not something that happens overnight. It happens over a very, 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 very long time. Um, and it's generally not with the latanoprost. If it occurs, it's generally with uh, the medication called bimatoprost or Lumigan. Generally think latanoprost is safe. Um, 
the only uh, advantage of using the bimatoprost or Lumigan is that it, it can potentially lower the eye pressure a little bit more than the latanoprost. Thank you. Our next question. Does cornea thickness affect eye pressure? What was that again? Does cornea thickness okay. affect eye pressure? All right, so good question. So the cornea is the window of the eye and the machine that checks the eye pressure is actually touching onto the cornea. So if a person has a very thick cornea, then they can potentially handle a higher eye pressure than someone who has a thinner cornea. Um, now, when you go for your glaucoma suspect testing, they are gonna measure your corneal thickness. If you have a uh, very thin cornea, then your risk for glaucoma is higher. If you have a thick cornea, I mean, it hasn't really been, uh, uh, how it's taught to us is, is that you can generally handle a higher pressure. Thank you. I had, our next question. I had cataract surgery 12 years ago. I developed some floaters. Do they cause any other problems going forward? Floaters are very common. It's more common to see them after cataract surgery. Believe it or not, you're actually seeing the contents of your, your own eye. You're seeing that well. Um, they do not cause glaucoma or any other major problems with the eyes. There are some unfortunate people who can develop retinal detachments or tears of the retina if they have lots and lots of floaters. Um, if a person does have floaters, I do recommend getting an examination, especially if um, there's bright flashing lights associated with them. But if it's a chronic thing, um, it generally does not cause any, it generally does not cause a retinal detachment. But if it's like an acute change, in the flashing lights or the floaters, then that is a reason to go and see a retina provider for an eye exam. Thank you. Our next question. Actually, this is not a question, this is a comment. Thank you for this thorough list of resources. I will certainly share these. Also, thank you for the point about the air puff test and empower me to ask for the blue light test. Our next question. Explain purpose and use of the Amsler grid test. The Amsler grid test is really to monitor diseases of the macula. The macula is the area in the eye of fine central vision. If the macula has damage, then a person can develop wavy vision. And so for anyone who has a macular degeneration or an epiretinal membrane, we ask them to look at the Amsler grid and um, look at it every day. There's a little black circle in the center. You're supposed to look at the black center, and then if you see any of those lines that should be straight, look wavy at any point, then it's an indication that you should go and, again, see a retina specialist. Thank you. Our next question, can cataracts cause narrowing of the canal? And I'm sorry, what was the question again? Can cataracts? Cause narrowing of the canal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, cataracts are basically crystals that grow in the eye. They occupy space. So the bigger they get, they can narrow the drainage canal of the eye. It is a good idea at that point to have cataract surgery to try to prevent glaucoma. There's something called angle closure or angle closure glaucoma, where the narrowness of the angle can then lead to the high eye pressure. And for um, some people, we recommend a laser treatment and others, we recommend a cataract surgery. But the discussion of who should have cataract versus laser is really um, patient doctor dependent. Thank you. Our next question, how does latanoprost work? Okay, latanoprost works by increasing the outflow of the eye. Um, it works through um, a system called the uveoscleral meshwork, trabecular meshwork area. Thank you. What eye pressure can you expect to get with glaucoma eye drops? Also, is there any relationship with glaucoma and diabetes? There is not any known uh, direct correlation between diabetes and glaucoma. Um, the eye drops vary. Some of them can cause an eye pressure reduction of around 20% and others can cause 40%. Um, usually when we use combination drops, they can lower the eye pressure a little bit more and also have fewer, fewer side effects. Thank you. Is Combigan good eye drop medication to control pressure? Combigan is one of the, the combination medicines of a beta blocker and an alpha agonist. And I do, yes, think it's a good medication. Okay. Are cataracts a frequent permitted, permitted be, permitted to, with glaucoma? 
Do cataracts complicate glaucoma treatments in significant ways? Um, you want me to repeat that? Uh, no, I, I got the question, but um, that's a very specific question that um, can really only be answered by looking at a, a, each each person individually. Okay. I have heard about injections in the eye for glaucoma. Please say more about this. Where to inject in the eye? The injection occurs in the anterior chamber, which is the front of the eye. It is in front of the cataract or the lens implant. Um, and some, uh, we're now actually have a, an injectable device that goes into the drainage canal of the eye itself. That is being done in the surgery centers. Um, it's called IDOS. And um, we just use a small incision and implant it right in the, in the drainage system and that's it. Thank you. All right, just for our audience, we have about three minutes remaining and we have about nine questions. So any questions we do not get to, I'll, I'll make sure I pass those questions on to Dr. Colleen. And I have everyone, everyone that attend today's email address and we'll get those answers out to you. Dr. Colleen, my next question is, do you have a reference for the history of glaucoma medicine? My grandmother had glaucoma treated at JSU more than a hundred years ago. Um, so if you go to my website, diagnosisglaucoma.com, um, the book that I wrote, there is a section on the eye drops. I don't remember what chapter it is right now, but it is a very thorough and updated discussion of the different eye drops. Thank you. Can you recommend research articles or a book comparing the efficacy of antioxidant foods versus AREDS 2? Um, AREDS is actually used to treat macular degeneration, and I don't know the reference off the top of my head, but um, I believe that there are some good uh, resources online. Thank you. I think this is a repeat question. Move on to the next one. Does cataract surgery increase the risk for A and B? No. Short answer. <laughs> okay. Next question, how common is glaucoma among people over 65? Aging is a risk factor. And the exact number, I don't know off the top of my head, but but I can tell you that as we age, um, everything, I mean, things start uh, not working. <laughs> they start slowing down a little bit. And so the drainage system of the eye can also start slowing down and the pressure can start going up. Thank you. And our last question is going to be from Gloria. Will you make your slides available, please. I will leave it up to you. <laughs> okay, we'll make sure we get those slides out. Well, thanks for- Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the Q&A period in today's meeting. The Community Health and Wellness Department here at Suburban Hospital would again like to thank you all for attending and Dr. Clean for her presence here today. We hope the information she shared is beneficial to each and every one of you. Also a reminder to please answer the survey and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tony. That was, wow, that was so busy. <laughs> so many questions.